Well, it's always uh, a very warm welcome to you. Good morning to you. Delighted to be able to welcome you one and all here uh, from uh, really all over the country as well as all over the, the city and uh, further beyond that as well. So a very warm welcome to you all here. I know a, a number of you here in connection with the baptism which we'll have early in the service and uh, delighted to welcome you. A very special occasion for you as uh, family and we're delighted to be able to share that privilege, blessing under God with you this morning. And uh, those of you joining us online, it is always a real pleasure to have you joining us as well. And uh, wherever you are, whatever your circumstances this morning, uh, a very warm welcome to you as well. I hope that you will feel very much a part of our service of worship here and have that sense of sharing in the presence of Almighty God as we join together in worship. Uh, we have our prayer meeting every Saturday evening, and uh, we will start off with uh, a, a psalm. We just kind of go through the, the book of Psalms uh, in sequence. And uh, last night, the, the Psalm 81 starts off, and uh, Frank, who was leading us through it, reminded us, uh, uh, really, the, the exhortation of all Scripture is to uh, sound out the praise of God. Sing to God with joy our strength. Shout aloud to the God of Jacob, begin the music, strike the tambourine, play the melodious harp and lyre. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. And uh, that's our expectancy this morning as we gather, that as we open our mouths in song, as we open our hearts in praise, the Lord himself will fill it. And uh, let's then join together in the worship of God in singing together the words of the psalm, uh, Lord, thee my God, I'll early seek. Let us worship God. Let's uh, bow together in prayer before God. Let us all pray. Living God, it is uh, yourself that we desire to meet. It is to meet with you, to know you, to hear you, to enjoy you, that we gather here, uh, not simply to go through some empty rituals, but rather to engage with yourself. And we delight so to do, to lift up our voices in praise, and even as we sound out your praise, to rejoice again in both your power and your love. How mighty you are. How extraordinary is that power that belongs to yourself. You underline that for us from the very beginning. You introduce yourself to us as that God who is able simply to speak and it is done. That God who is able to cause light to erupt into the darkness. That God who is able to cause life to erupt out of the tomb. And we're glad that in the person of your son, the Lord Jesus, you have come right into this world to make that power, that power to impart life, to generate growth, to make that immediately available for us that we may know that same transforming power in our lives and how glad we are in the knowledge that the power that belongs to you uh, such a vast mighty power is combined with the most exquisite love 
a passionate love, a love that flows from your heart, a love that understands us, a love that is patient with us, a love that is gentle with us, a love that is kind and generous towards us beyond all measure. And again, how glad we are that you simply don't declare these things to, the, to us. You, you have come to us in the person of your son in order to demonstrate that and to make that same love available to us as well. And we thank you, therefore, for the gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that you sent him into this world that he might do for us and as one of us what we could never do ourselves despite our best endeavors and intentions to live that life of perfect obedience, then to stand in our place and to bear the consequences of our lack of obedience in the death that he died of utter God forsaken us on the cross, and how glad we are, gracious God, that in your own kind power you have raised him from the dead, his work complete, so that there's nothing we now need to add to that. And you commend him to us as the one who is alive, the one who is king, the one who exercises that good, wise rule over our lives in a way that brings order and light and beauty and life into our experience. We're hungry for him, eager for your and pray simply that in our worship today you would draw near to us, make yourself known to us, and grant to us your blessing. Uh, help us in that worship that we may bring to you praise and worship from our heart that is pleasing and honoring to yourself. And we ask it all through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. When we turn to uh, read uh, the scripture, Nick is going to come and read just a few verses from the start of Isaiah chapter 44. Good morning. The reading, Isaiah 44, verses 1 to 5. It's on page 729 of the church Bible. Isaiah 44, verse 1. But now listen, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. This is what the Lord says, he who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you. Do not be afraid, O Jacob, my servant. Jeshurun, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. One will say, I belong to the Lord. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Still another will write on his hand, the Lord's, and will make the name Israel. Amen. Great. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Nick is one of our elders here. And uh, this morning we, we have, uh, God's and boys, we have a baptism. And so I'm going to ask um, Matt and Sarah to come up with their little boy out the front here and uh, just try and explain uh, a little bit about what's going to happen here uh, to you uh, from the passage that we read. Who can remember what book of the Bible Nick read from? Sam? Isaiah, that's right. And who can remember what chapter it was? Yep. 44, that's right. How many people here are 44 years old or older? <laughs> yeah, okay, we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, young folk here, uh, which is good. Right, so what, um, what the passage was about um, was uh, really about a promise, okay? Um, yesterday, we, we had a, a kind of celebration of a marriage here where the couple were making promises to one another. And I wonder if you can guess what the couple gave to each other. You want to guess what they gave? Yep, Hannah, you got an idea? You know, yep, Matthew. Rings, absolutely right. They, they gave rings to each other. Um, and the rings are a kind of sign of the promise. 
And one of the things about a ring, obviously, it just goes on and on and on and on forever. When you start one bit, it doesn't come to an end. It just goes on and on. And that's the love that they're promising to one another. So the ring is quite a good sign or picture of the promise that they're making. Now, baptism is, is a little bit like that. It's the sign of a promise that God makes. Okay? So we'll put a picture on the screen for you, and you'll get an idea. Uh, who knows what that is on the screen? Yes, Hannah. Water, absolutely right. Loads of it as well, because God is, is uh, a generous God, and the water is uh, designed to help us understand just a little bit about what is going on in uh, baptism. And there are uh, these five things that we'll run through very briefly. Number one, God makes wonderful promises, okay? Um, the Bible is full of promises that God makes. The God who made the world has promised all sorts of wonderful things. He said to his people, I will be with you always. That's a promise, okay? And God uh, always keeps his promises. So that's the, the first thing. Uh, the second thing is when we, we say, okay, so, so what are these promises? Uh, the promise that God gives really deals with the deepest problems we have. And the promise God makes is he promises forgiveness and renewal. Uh, he promises that he'll kind of clean us up uh, how many of you have used water already this morning? Okay. Most grown-ups haven't. So I suggest uh, if you, you know, that's maybe one of the first things you want to do when you go back. We use water to clean ourselves up and uh, are, are glad to, to have that just kind of feeling clean. Some of you have a shower, some of you have a bath, some of you just kind of use a face cloth and all sorts of stuff. Uh, but we use water to clean us up. And so the water reminds us, that's what God does. He, he just kind of wipes the slate clean, all the things that are, are wrong in our lives and so on, wipes them away. But the problem often is that we just keep doing them. And so what we need is, is to be made new people as well. And in the same way as the water, uh, enables plants to grow and enables us to grow as well. So the water reminds us not only does God give us forgiveness, but he gives to us new life as well. Third thing you need to remember in the Bible is that God's promises to us are found and become ours in Jesus. So it is as we look to him, as we trust in him, as we begin to follow him, that all the promises that God has made, they become ours. They, they are true for us. God said, I'll be with you, I'll forgive you, I'll make you new, and uh, they all become true in Jesus when we learn to follow him. Uh, it's wonderful. That's the third thing. The fourth thing is that God uh, promises to give his spirit to us. And uh, so he, he promises, and one of the pictures that's used in the Bible is, is kind of like water. Just God pours out his Holy Spirit upon us uh, so that our lives are, are simply soaked in his Holy Spirit. He comes to live in us, to live through us, to be our help and our strength. And, and it's an amazing life that he gives us, therefore, to live. And so the, the water is just a reminder that God pours out his Spirit upon us. And uh, the, uh, the fifth thing that I was going to remind you of is that God promises to be the God of our children as well, which is amazing. He, uh, his promise covers our children. I will be your God, he says, and the God of your children. Long before they've even begun to understand anything about me, uh, he says, I'm going to be their God as well. I commit myself to them. And so the baptism, the water that is used now to baptize Caleb is uh, the, the picture of the promise that God has made and, and the assurance to us, that's what he's promised to do. He's promised to be not only Matt and Sarah's God, to be with them, to help them, to forgive them, to be their strength and their enabling. But he said, you know what? I'll be his God as well. He doesn't even understand that yet. All he does is wriggle and, uh, you know, move around and crawl into all sorts of places and discover the world. Uh, he hasn't a clue about what the Bible has said, but God said long before he's done anything, I'm committed to him as well. And so the, uh, the baptism is, is a reminder to us that, that God's gift to us in Jesus is an amazing promise that he has made uh, in which he's done everything that needs to be done and we simply receive the blessings and the promises that are his. Now it is a promise uh, that is given to those who trust in the Lord Jesus. And so as uh, Matt and Sarah bring their little boy, uh, and we'll put a picture of him on the screen. His name is Caleb Matthew Kirkwood, okay? And uh, he's a, a lovely little boy, uh, born back in April. And it's uh, a, a real joy to have um, his wider family, uh, aunts, uncles, 
grandparents, and even, I think online, great-grandparents as well. Um, it's lovely. It's just he, He's part of a family and part of that wider family of God's people as well. So we're delighted to be able to welcome his family uh, here as well to share in this very special occasion. And uh, Matt and Sarah, um, they long since entrusted their lives to the Lord Jesus, said, Jesus, we're yours. Uh, you're king. We're going to follow you. And uh, they've been living like that, looking to the Lord day by day and grateful to God for the gift that he's given to them of their wee boy and uh, thankful for the promise that God has made that covers uh, their son as well. So they're going to make uh, their vows, which they affirm again, that trust in Jesus and commit themselves to be uh, bringing Caleb up uh, for the Lord. And as they make their vows, uh, just as a, a mark of your kind of standing with them to pray for them, to encourage them, uh, I'd ask you as a congregation, as you're able, please now to stand. We'll put the vows on the screen for you uh, so that you see what uh, is being asked. Matt and Sarah, do you gratefully offer yourselves afresh in faith to Almighty God, delighting in the Father into whose family you've been brought, trusting in Jesus, God's Son, by whose costly grace alone you've been saved, and relying always on the Holy Spirit through whose work you are being changed. I do. And do you thus commit yourselves to live in every regard as disciples and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the help of the Holy Spirit, and to the glory of the Father, teaching your Son the truths and duties of the Christian faith, and by your prayers, example, and instruction, bringing him up in the way of Christ our Lord. I do. The Lord bless you and enable you faithfully to keep these promises. Do have a, a seat. And Caleb, Matthew Kirkwood. There we go, that panicked look on his face. Right? Uh, you're not going to dive in there? No. Caleb, I baptize you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest on and remain <laughs> with you always. Amen. By this sign of baptism, this little boy is welcomed among us as part of the family of God. He's already begun to get to know uh, not only his own immediate family, uh, but the wider family of the church here. Uh, he enjoys coming on a Wednesday as well, enjoys the bubbles, not least, that uh, culminate the mainly music, uh, full of fun, full of activity, full of interest in the world in which he lives. And by this sign, he is not only welcomed among us as part of that wider family, but is engaged long before he even realizes it to be Christ's loyal servant, from his uh, earliest beginnings to his life's end. And Matt and Sarah will raise him in that concern to nurture him in the knowledge and love of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray for them and for him and for all the children growing up among us now. Let us pray. Living God, we thank you indeed for the gift that you have given to Matt and Sarah of their little boy, we thank you for the delight that he has already brought to them and to their families. And we thank you, living God, for the name that he bears, a name that in Scripture speaks of a man who grew to love and to follow you, the Lord, wholeheartedly, right on into his latter years, always growing, always eager to serve and to give of himself to your glory. And we pray that that may indeed be the pattern of this little boy's life, that he will grow to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ who will love Jesus more and more, delight to serve him, and whose gifts, talents, personality will be used by yourself to advance your kingdom and to bring honor and praise to your great name. We pray, Lord God, that you'd help Matt and Sarah as they raise him giving them wisdom, patience, strength, and grace, 
and that you would use them for the praise of your glory in his life, that he may recognize in them the beauty of a life lived to the glory of Jesus and in the strength of your spirit. Bless them and keep them and watch over all the children growing up among us. Guard and keep them in all their circumstances that they may know your hand upon them and delight to follow Jesus. And this we ask for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Well, we're going to join to sing the words of the blessing now all together. Uh, a word of prayer, as it were, in which we together bring the blessing of God to bear upon his life. Do please stand for this. And as uh, we sing the blessing, I think Sylvanus is going to come and bring up a little card for Caleb. As uh, you're standing, stay standing. We're going to join to sing just before you head off out to Sunday School Girls and Boys, uh, a reminder of uh, just how great our God is. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing he can't do. Off you go to Sunday school, enjoy your time at Sunday school this morning. And any visitors, more than welcome to bring their children along as well. welcoming you one and all to our worship of God here this morning. It's a particular pleasure to welcome uh, Steve Osmond and his wife Robin. Um, Steve now works for Solas. Uh, they've had quite a weekend of it up at uh, Deeside, a kind of youth night on Friday evening, and then uh, a day conference yesterday on uh, Confident Christianity. And uh, I'll not uh, steal Steve's thunder. Uh, Steve's originally from South Africa, 
uh, from Joburg out in South Africa, has uh, uh, exercised a pastoral ministry there and uh, been involved in a range of different things and has been delighted over these past months to identify with and now to be a speaker for Solas. And so, uh, Steve, uh, it's our pleasure to welcome you. I hope you're not too exhausted after your weekend. Uh, he does have some slides, and I guess, David, you'll keep us right on the slides up there. Um, if you need the slide to move on, just uh, ask David. You'll see it. Great. Lovely to have you. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, so much for inviting me up to just um, be able to share a little bit about Solus and the ministry um, that we do. And so, yes, as uh, Jerry has mentioned, I am from South Africa, and um, I apologize for that, just thinking back to the rugby, and I know there may, may be some, some of you from England in the crowd, and I do apologize. I don't think we should have won, I'm just saying. But anyway... That's neither here nor there. We can edit that out for my South African friends. Um, yeah, so I, I came to join uh, the Ministry of Solas. You know, the whole family we, we came across uh, just over three months ago, um, really because I believe in uh, the work that Solas does. And so um, it's a, just a, a privilege and a pleasure for me to be able to come and speak to you this morning and just give you a little glimpse um, of what it is that uh, we do. The word Solas uh, comes from the Gallic word meaning light, and so that is essentially the light of Christ that we want to be taking into a world that is uh, so desperately in need of light and love and, and justice and really to see God work and move and change things really in the midst of so much, um, so much turmoil and, and so much um, that makes us really wonder where is there actually hope. Uh, my background is in the, the sciences. I studied at the University of Johannesburg. I did a master's uh, in the sciences. And it was in my time there that I became a Christian. And I often started getting these questions, you know, well, how can you be a scientist but also believe in God? Surely these things are mutually exclusive. They, they just don't make sense when you try and put them together. You have to choose science or you have to choose God. It's one or the other. And this was perturbing to me, obviously. And I started to find out that there are actually answers. There are really good answers for these questions. There is very good evidence for the Christian uh, faith. And so I would have, I would have ticked the, the Christian box indeed, um, but I wasn't very confident. I wasn't someone who was really going out there and sharing my faith. I wasn't evangelizing. Um, and that was until I met someone who started coaching me a little bit um, in the fact that there are actually very good answers. And so I am by no means a natural evangelist, and so it might seem strange to you that I'm working now as a full-time apologist and evangelist for a ministry in a different country. Um, but what changed for me to really move me from a place of being scared of evangelism, the idea of sharing my faith absolutely terrified me. What if I didn't have the right answers? What if I, I made God look bad? What if I didn't present the gospel properly? All these things in my mind. And it was only in coming to know that actually there are really good answers out there for these questions that started building my confidence. And the second thing, and, and I suppose more pivotal, was actually the use of questions. We can use questions to actually enter into really good conversations and be able to share our faith. So I learned that there's good evidence, there's good reason to be a Christian, but also I learned some tools in how to actually speak to pop people um, and, and have actually good conversations that lead to spiritual conversations and on to actually sharing the gospel with those around us. And so Solus is a ministry that really focuses on doing that. Solus exists for the purpose of persuasive evangelism. Let me read you just a few, uh, just a quick scripture. Um, our Lord speaking in Matthew 28, verse 18, you, you're probably well aware of this. Jesus speaking to them said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you even to the end of the age. And so just really, um, what a joy to just witness a baptism uh, this morning to be here with you for that. And, and that is it. We want to see more people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. We want to, we want to actually be taking that, uh, that commission that Jesus gave us to take the gospel out to the world. But that is not that easy. If you look around and see what culture is, is saying, there's so much confusion. There's so much that seems to be in opposition to the faith that we have. And so we need to start digging a bit deeper and see, well, how can we actually take it to them in a way that is persuasive. 
you look at Paul in Acts 17, he goes to the Areopagus, which is the, really the philosophical hub of the world at the time, and he goes in and sees all these statues around, um, and he finds one that says, to the unknown God. And he goes and he finds this as a way into conversation to actually point them to the true God, uh, the, the God of the Bible. So he, he, he looked at what they were already worshipping, and he used that. And we, we want to use that same pattern. We want to see what, what things there are in our world that we can actually take and point, use to point people to God. In 1 Peter 3.15, we have the commission, always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that is in you, that is the hope in Christ, but be able to do it with gentleness and respect. And so the Bible is clear. We need to be doing this. We must be sharing our faith, but that is difficult. And so that is where the ministry of Solus really comes in. And so if we can move over to the next slide uh, on evangelism. There we go. Um, one thing we do is evangelism training. Um, I was at a church in Glasgow not too long ago. Um, oh, sorry, not evangelism training, it's evangelism. Um, and uh, there's a, a church, uh, we do evangelism training, that's next. But um, a church has invited us around and they'd organized an event where for a couple of weeks they'd done a, a bit of promo and uh, people invited their non-Christian friends, family and colleagues to this event and we come in and we speak at those events and we, speak, we, we, we give evangelistic messages based on whatever topic it is that the church has invited us to, to speak on or sometimes at churches, at bars, um, curry houses, wherever it may be, we'll go in and we'll give a, a message that would take some, some cultural question and we use that as a way to then move towards sharing uh, the gospel. So we do that at universities. We work a lot with Christian unions uh, as well. In February I'm doing a whole week uh, with the University of St. Andrews and then after that a week um, with the, uh, the, the CU group uh, in Edinburgh. Um, so really looking forward to that because we're basically going into the university and we'll, we don't know who's in the audience and we'll just face questions and, and I absolutely love that. Um, and that is part of the ministry we do. The second part is uh, evangelism training. Uh, and so yesterday we were at uh, Deeside uh, Community Church, uh, which is a, a lovely place, and we were doing a training, basically a half-day training on several topics. There I spoke on the uniqueness of Christ. My colleague and our director, Andy, spoke on uh, technology and artificial intelligence, which is a, a big topic, um, and, and really just training people on how do you use these things for, uh, for the gospel. Another thing we have is online resources. If you want to move us to the next slide, thank you. Um, so we have a whole range of online resources that we produce. If we go to the next slide, one of those is short answer videos. We have, I think now, over 200 short answer videos. These are around about four to five minute clips on just about anything. Um, and so these are things that you can yourself look at to, to learn a bit about um, a certain topic, or they are fantastic things to use to actually give to friends, family, colleagues who might have questions. Um, I often might get a question, and, and it's a wonderful thing to be able to say to someone, I just don't know the answer. Um, I'm just, you know, popping to the toilet quickly, and you quickly go and you cycle through these things, you find the short answer you need, have a look, come back, and boom, there you go. Or just share it with them, and, you know, they can chew on that. So that's one thing we do. Um, we've done a, a series called Have You Ever Wondered? So if we go to the next slide, um, a, sh a short video series on these wondering questions. There are these aspects like justice, hope, love, beauty, and we can take these things because they are shared amongst us as people made in the image of God. And we can actually take them and use them to enter into really good conversations with people. So have you ever wondered why justice? Why, why do we hold justice to be such a, such a value, even though it, it makes no sense if there is no God? We can, we can take things like that, like beauty and love, and we can use them to enter into good conversation. We have a series of videos that will show you how to do that. It's all absolutely free. You can just go to the website and check those out. Um, what next? So that's just a little bit about what we do. How can you, um, as a church, as individuals, be involved? Um, so until our next slide. The first would be, um, I've told you that we go into universities and that is in many ways very terrifying. I'm not gonna lie, as much as I've done it quite a bit, it, is, it, is, it gets the adrenaline going to, to have to stand in front of a crowd and you don't know what you're gonna get. And so prayer, 
we would just ask, you know, as much as I've shared a little bit about Solas, if you could be praying for us, for the team as we go off and speak at churches, as we speak in universities, then indeed the Spirit of God would be moving and working and just empowering us to have the right words at the right time uh, and being able to give an answer for the hope but, that we have, but doing it with that love and that gentleness. Uh, the second would be, as I mentioned already, to use the resources we have. We have a lot of donors who uh, support the ministry, and we want to be doing the best that we can to actually make resources that are freely available to uh, Christians to use them in the evangelistic effort. So I encourage you, head over to the website um, and, and uh, have a look at all of that stuff there. And then third um, is uh, financial su support, but um, I'm not going to um, say too much about that. I'd rather just direct you to the website, have a look around, look at the ministry of Solas, and I would encourage you to, to be thinking as, um, as individuals and as a church, if the ministry of Solas is something that you think is useful, maybe start thinking about, well, how may you as a church potentially be able to, to use us um, to maybe put on some kind of evangelistic event or in small groups uh, if you would like some kind of training or as we've done at Deeside uh, Fellowship, as Jerry mentioned, a confident Christianity conference, which we can do um, if that's something that you would at all be interested in. Um, so maybe in your, um, in your church community, you can think about that, look at the work we do and see if, that, if you think this would be something valuable uh, for you. So after the uh, service, I'll just hang around at the back. I have a few uh, little cards which I forgot to bring up with me um, that have a QR code which you can scan and it'll take you right to those uh, resources that I've mentioned. And then you can fire off some questions at me and chat. Uh, I'd love to chat to you about um, just a bit more about what we do and the ministry of uh, Solas. Um, again, thank you so much for having me up to just share a little bit about the very exciting work that we do. Good. Uh, stay here just for a moment. Yep. Uh, we'll pray for you. Thank we you. do uh, pray for Solace. We, uh, we get the, the news from you and the updates and uh, are glad of that. Um, let me underline um, just how useful those resources are. I regularly have recourse to them. Uh, you may think that as the minister, you surely know everything. I haven't a clue. Um, and it's brilliant. Short answers. Uh, all sorts of questions. 200 sort of questions there. And, and they're all freely available. You're not having to spend hours kind of going through a big tome. Uh, it's just a, a very short video presentation. Uh, very engaging and really helpful. So do take a note of the website. Do use those, uh, the short answers. They have you ever wondered as well. And... Um, at the end of the service, you can test them out, fire whatever questions you have, Adam. You don't have to be a student to do that, um, but if you are, um, then just be nice. And um, you know, he's, he's got a wife and family as well, and uh, uh, look after the guys. Well, we value the work that uh, that you do, and are glad to to pray for it. Let's pray. Living God, um, we were uh, very aware we, we live in a world where. Uh, necessarily there are all sorts of questions that, that we have as we try and get our heads around all that goes on in the world, uh, so much that uh, happens. Um, and these past years with the pandemic that there's been and the conflicts that there have been and climate change and, and all sort of political upheavals, and um, uh, sometimes it's just hard to comprehend what, what on earth is it all about? Where on earth is it all going? And uh, we thank you that you've made us with that capacity to think things through and to, to look for, uh, for answers, to try and apply our minds. And we thank you, therefore, for this particular ministry uh, that is, is uh, called in a being, we believe, by yourself. Uh, thank you for the, the likes of uh, David Robertson. Uh, down in Dundee as he was now out in Australia and for that, that commitment that he had to engage in the marketplace as it were with the, the sort of questions that people had and the perspectives with which people came uh, for Andy Bannister and the, uh, the role that he's had and the way that he's just grown into that and now for Steve coming on board as well uh, thank you for Steve and Robin and their children uh, we pray your particular blessing on them that they would have been refreshed despite all the output over this weekend and that you would equip and enable Steve for uh, ministry in the uh, university context in coming days. Pray that he may know that enabling of your Holy Spirit that 
uh, as he's bombarded with a, a range of different questions, left field, some of them, uh, he may just know the help of your Holy Spirit, knowing what illustrations to use, what pictures to use, what uh, context to set these things in, and that you would empower and embolden him and that there should be a real authority in the manner in which he speaks, that those to whom and with whom he's speaking would indeed be able to recognize that behind Steve there is your risen son. Behind the, uh, the ministry of Solus, uh, there is uh, a mighty Lord who is the wonderful counselor. And so many of us, Father, we just need counseling. We need to be helped to navigate our way through life and how we thank you that in Jesus, you've come to provide that counselor for us, to provide that shepherd, to lead his sheep, to provide that king, to rule his people, to protect, to help, to provide for us. And as we pray, Lord God, this morning, we, we want to include in our prayers all who are struggling, some with illness, some with bereavement, and the pain and grief of that, uh, some because of their financial and material circumstances, some because of relational issues going on in their lives that are just hard to handle, um, some living God uncertain about the future, uh, some struggling uh, with uh, uh, big life issues. And on the, the larger canvas, Lord, it's, it's hard for us even to begin to comprehend what it's like to be in places like the Ukraine or in uh, Israel and Gaza at this time with all the uncertainties and all the inflammatory attitudes that there have been and remain. And we long for you, living God, please, to step into these situations uh, with all your grace, with all your wisdom, with all your power, with all your justice. And uh, we cry out to you with countless others, please, living God, have mercy upon us. Hear us then in these our prayers. Uh, prosper the ministry of Solas. Bless and encourage Steve and Robin and uh, the team at Solas. Meet them in their needs. Use them for your glory and use us too in that same manner. And we'll gladly give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. A revelation to you. Thank you very much. Um, he'll be at the back uh, with material at the end. And uh, they are just little cards and they have a very convenient QR code. And if you are familiar with how to use QR codes, um, that's just uh, straight in access to what you're looking for there. Before we turn ourselves to the, the Word of God this morning, uh, we're going to join to sing again. Uh, a hymn, a song that uh, really just reminds us of what sometimes we need to, to know. And it, it, um, it did occur to me, um, praying through this morning, that uh, it may be that, that this is what you need to hear this morning. Our sins, they are many, but his mercy is always more. And if you've been struggling with things in your life and just... Uh, uh, really down because you feel you have, you have just gone beyond the pale in things that you've done, then um, you come to the right place. In Jesus, this is the truth. Your sins, they may be many, but his mercy is more. Let's, let's rejoice in that as we sound out his praise.
As many of you know, my, my wife is, is often away. Uh, we have three sons. Each of them have a number of children, and uh, she has uh, quite a um, wide-ranging role as a child minder filling in for the gaps. And uh, there was a time not that long ago when she had been in a whole range of different places, and I remember she woke up one morning and she said to me, where am I and how did I get here? And, and I, I, I was surprised at six o'clock that she was asking such profound philosophical questions until I realized that she wasn't asking a philosophical question at all. She was just uh, clueless, you know, she'd been in so many different places. Uh, she'd lost track of where she actually was. Uh, but it is a question, I guess, that uh, in many regards, we, we often find ourselves asking, uh, where am I and how did I get here? And, and sometimes we can land in a place that is singularly uncomfortable, a place that is uh, very dark, very difficult, where a whole series of different choices that we've made have landed us in what feels like a total mess. Uh, and we don't really recognize how, how on earth we can get out of there. And we, we wonder, how, how did I get into this in the first place? It wasn't my intention to live life in such a way that I ended up in a mess. So how did I get here? And in some ways, that's really the, the kind of backdrop to the passage that we are looking at over these weeks in Jeremiah chapter 2. Um, the experience of the people of God back in Jeremiah's time, uh, hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus, where despite all that God had done for them, they, they had ended up in a situation which was going to culminate in their being removed from the land and their city that they had always regarded as being utterly inviolable, uh, being reduced to rubble. How on earth did a people like that get there? How on earth did a people so singularly blessed end up in such a mess? And we might well ask the same question in regard to the nation of Scotland. How on earth did a nation so singularly blessed over countless centuries end up in such a spiritual mess as we find ourselves in today? And it may well be that we ask the same question about ourselves as individuals. Despite all the background that maybe we had, all the influences that there were in our lives that sought to commend the good news of Jesus, that sought to raise us and do us good in the knowledge of the living God and his word, uh, yet we, we kind of made a whole series of different choices and ended up in a bit of a mess. How did we get there? And there's a sense in which, although what Jeremiah is bringing is, is a message that, that kind of sounds pretty negative in many ways, because it's, it's the Lord speaking into this situation and, and really charging them with, with what has gone wrong in their life. What, what I want to do in looking at it like that is, is not hide from the, the challenge of that, but to see the flip side. And so if you want to avoid ending in that sort of situation, how, how do you avoid drifting away into a mess in your life? And that's how we're going to view it uh, in these verses. In Jeremiah chapter 2, if you have a Bible to hand, um, that's really all that we're going to do. It's, it's not me kind of spouting forth my opinions and my thoughts on the world in which we live. Um, it is simply our coming to the Word of God, uh, learning from the Word of God, trying to understand what it says, how it applies to ourselves, and to see the import of that for us in our lives today. Jeremiah chapter uh, two, uh, chapter 2 and at verse 9. Uh, we're not going to read uh, really many verses, chapter 9, verses 9 to 13, and, and it really divides into two unequal sections, the first of which is verses 9 to 12. And uh, we'll read them first so that you, you know what we're on about. Therefore, says the Lord, on the back of what he's uh, been saying, we looked at that last Sunday morning, therefore I bring charges against you again, declares the Lord. And I will bring charges against your children's children. Remember back in verse 5, 
Uh, he's uh, been speaking about their ancestors. Now he's talking about them and their children and their children's children. What he seems to be pointing to is the fact that um, there, there does seem to be a pattern of behavior, a pattern of thinking, a pattern of choosing that is persistent from one generation down to another, a kind of besetting sin in the fabric and the DNA of that society. Um, I will bring charges against your children's children. Verse 10, cross over to the coast of Cyprus. That's uh, from where they are in the west. Uh, and look, send to Kedar, that's Arabia, that's more in the east, and observe closely. So he's, he's saying, uh, look to the west, look to the east, kind of look wherever you like and observe closely, see if there has ever been anything like this. Has a nation ever changed its gods? Brackets, yet they're not gods at all. But my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. Now, the first um, heading, I suppose, is this. What, what we learn from this is the importance of uh, our cultivating faith. Um, that's the, the first thing that we, we really need to, to recognize here. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about the, the nature of that faith that the Bible speaks about. Faith is essentially not something purely intellectual. You know, there are certain things that we believe. Faith is understood in the Bible as essentially a relational thing. On the back of what we have come to believe, we entrust ourselves to this God. We make a commitment to this God. Uh, not a blind faith, but a, an informed faith, um, a studied faith. We've asked the questions, we've explored and looked at the evidence. And on the basis of that, we, we figure, yeah, this Jesus is for real. Uh, he is who he claims to be, the very son of God. Uh, he did come into this world, he did live, he did suffer, he did die, he was buried, and he was, remarkably, raised from the dead. All of that, well evidenced. And we, we look at that and conclude, yeah, um, however unlikely it may seem, that's the truth. And therefore, as the one who is king, to whom all authority in heaven and on earth belongs, yeah, I, I, I entrust my life to him. So faith is that commitment of our lives to him. And um, we, we do well to understand it like that. What we need to understand is you have to work at that, though. Uh, it doesn't magically happen, and it doesn't magically grow, and it doesn't magically stay there. You have to work at it. You have to cultivate faith. And so what he says here, what the Lord says to the people is essentially, translating it from um, the way it appears in your Bible, there's essentially three things that he is underlining. First of which is uh, this people who have drifted away from the Lord. Uh, he says, you're out of line. You're out of line with pretty much everyone else in the world. It's kind of daft. You are people who better than any should have been committed and should have retained that commitment You've drifted from it. You kind of swap around and move around. And that's, that's just out of line with what you see all around you in the world. Look, he says, to the west, look to the east, and, uh, and you just won't find this. The pattern is, by and large, people stick with their gods, even although they're not gods at all. I remember many years ago when I was uh, in Edinburgh conducting the funeral of a young man called John. He was 33 years old. And it was, you'd understand, uh, an untimely death. He was an avid supporter of a football team in Glasgow that wears blue. Uh, just so you know which one we're talking about here. Whose, whose kind of logo, interestingly, is follow. And whose song is follow. Follow, follow, I mean, it's not, it's never going to be sort of number one in the hip parade, never going to be a, a work of art, but follow, follow. Uh, we will follow the team, Rangers, in other words, I, I had to say it eventually. Uh, we will follow Rangers. Um, everywhere, anywhere, we will follow on. Uh, and that's what he did. Absolutely everywhere, anywhere, they were playing, he'd be there. 
and, and everyone knew him. Um, so at the funeral, there were a load of high agents from Rangers, including John Gregg, uh, who had been captain of Rangers, was now manager of Rangers. He was there, uh, a load of folk from the Rangers football club, a load of high agents there, a load of the supporters club. It was a massive funeral, a young man, 33 years old. And it was precisely because he had followed on anywhere and everywhere. He'd gone out to Romania. And, and he had eaten something there that, uh, that didn't agree with him and that resulted actually in a severe illness from which he actually died. He, he died because he had followed this team. And he, he went everywhere. It didn't matter how well they did. It didn't matter how they, uh, they, they, they fared, whether they lost, they won, they drew, or they were going in the doldrums or whatever it might be, or whether they'd been relegated or down to Division 3 because they'd, you know, all sorts of financial unfair play and so on. Uh, it didn't matter. He would just be there. He was following on. And that's what, that's what the Lord is saying. Look around. That's how people are. They're daft. But they do it. And they stick with their team. They stick with their religion, even although it doesn't help them at all. Whatever their God, maybe whatever they invest their lives in, whatever they pump their resources, their energies, their time, their money into doing, they, they do it with a whole heart and they stick with it, even although it does them no good at all. And even though they die as a result. Um, and Yui says, you, you're just out of line. That's the first thing he says. Second thing, he says, is uh, you're off your head. Or in Scotland, um, if the Lord is speaking to them, he says you're numpties. That's, I mean, it's a kind of loose translation of the Hebrew there, but that essentially is, uh, is what he's saying. You guys, you are numpties. You are just off your head when you stop and think about it. What have you done? Not even the nations around you would do this. Not even they are daft enough to do this. You have done a daft, daft thing. You have exchanged your glorious God, three words, your God, glorious God, and God. You've exchanged your glorious God for what? <laughs> for worthless idols that are dumb that are impassive, that can do nothing, and that do you no good at all. And, and you, you must be off your head to think that somehow you got a better deal with all these worthless idols. Back in their day, it was, uh, you know, it was kind of Baal worship and things like that, where uh, it, it looked quite attractive because it was, it was highly sexualized, it pandered to, uh, to the, the promiscuous elements in society. People were quite attracted to it, that sort of way. It looked quite appealing, but it did them no good at all. And, and you have exchanged, he says, um, your glorious God. The God who made the world, the God who runs the world, the God who orders it all, the God who is wise, who is good, who is kind, who is strong, the God who is altogether righteous. You have exchanged that God who is mighty, that God who declares and reveals himself to be the God who saves, the God who delivers. You've, you've exchanged that God uh, who is full of glory, the glory of his majesty, because he is the infinite, eternal creator God. There is no other God but him. He alone is God. He alone has been from all eternity. He alone will be through all eternity. He is infinite in all his attributes. He is full of glory. Everything about him is perfect. He is perfectly wise. He is perfectly strong. He is perfectly good. He is perfectly kind. He is perfect in every single regard. And he is your God. He is the God who has pledged himself to you, committed himself to you, committed himself to meet you in your needs, to protect you in your dangers, to uphold you and provide for you, and to rescue in all your troubles. You have exchanged that for worthless idols. Numpties, basically, is what he's saying. And the third thing that he says, and I think verse 12 really belongs here with this, is um, you're in the dock. And he calls the heavens to bear witness. And I think that this belongs with uh, uh, this particular part of the, the passage. Because back in Deuteronomy chapter 30, where um, Moses, who was the leader of the people of Israel at the time, is bringing to the people the terms, as it were, of that covenant commitment that God makes to his people. Chapter 30 um, 
Moses um, calls upon the heavens, uh, verse 19 of chapter 30. This day, says Moses, uh, and, and um, speaks in these terms. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I, the Lord, have set before you life and death, blessings and curse. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him for the Lord is your life. And he will give you many years in the land he swore to give your fathers, Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and he's calling the heavens to bear witness. So this is a, a kind of big deal. This is a, a commitment that God is making. He says, I will be your God. I will bring all my resources to bear upon your needs, your circumstances, in order to be your God, to be your very life. And I pledge myself to you. And, uh, and I said before you, you can either live with me and enjoy life and blessing, or you can live without me. Uh, and that way is a dead end. And, and so therefore, choose life. Choose me. The Lord is your life. You, you have no other life. And, and way back then, a hundred of years before Jeremiah's on the ball here, um, the Lord calls it with the heavens to bear witness. Okay, everyone, listen in and watch it. You're witness to this. I am pledging myself to this people in this manner. And so the Lord now calls the heavens to the, the dock here and says, listen, that's where the people have gone. They, they have chosen wrongly. They have made bad choices, and, and in those choices, they have, they have chosen to go another way. And uh, the heavens, who were witnesses to that, kind of, uh, they shudder. They think, that, that, uh, that, is, that is so, so crazy. That, that is so disastrous. Um, but they're, they're kind of in the dock, and, and the heavens are called a witness now that this is, this is what the people have done. Now, the flip side of that, obviously, is, is this. You do have to cultivate faith because it doesn't simply, magically sustain itself. And so you, you recognize, first of all, that faith is that commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. And a commitment is, is a commitment in which you... you you declare, I, I will follow you, whatever. Uh, when when you, you kind of adopt the line, well, I'll, I'll kind of give you a try, and if I don't like it, I'll, I'll kind of ditch it. That's not commitment. That, that's not commitment. Faith is a commitment. Um, yesterday at the, uh, the service of blessing on this marriage, they, they rehearsed their vows, and they run through the catalog. Um, it is for better or for worse. It is for richer or for poorer. It is in sickness and in health. Doesn't matter what the circumstances are. Doesn't matter how things are going to play out. I'm sticking with you. I'm committing myself to you. And that's the commitment that is involved in faith. We entrust ourselves to him and say, Jesus, I'm yours. And it's unconditional. So whatever happens, I'm yours. I'm following and um, maybe some of you, that's, that's really the first step that you, you need now to take, that you, you kind of know enough about this Jesus. You've learned enough about this Jesus, explored enough about him to know that, yeah, that's, that's the choice that you have. You're going to choose life. You're going to choose blessing. You're going to choose him. And are you going to commit yourself to him? Uh, we hope in January, uh, probably towards the end of January, to, to have a service in which there's that opportunity for those who've, who've never committed themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ to do so publicly. Uh, they won't know all the answers. They won't be saying, you know, we're going to live a perfect life. But they are saying, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. Wherever you take me, whatever it involves, whatever it costs, I'm with you. Uh, I'm yours, your Lord. Um, that's the first thing. We cultivate that faith by entrusting ourselves to him. Secondly, we, we remind ourselves continually that whatever our present circumstances may be, the God to whom we have entrusted ourselves is glorious. This Jesus has pledged himself to me as well, and he is mine, and I'm his. 
and he is full of glory. He is the great rescuer. He is the great deliverer. He is the wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. He is able to help me in whatever mess I find myself. He has undertaken to protect me, to provide for me, to guide me, to lead me, and to bring me safely to my desired haven. And I remind myself of that. I cultivate that faith. That's one of the reasons why we gather Sunday by Sunday, just to be reminded. That's who he is. We remind ourselves it's a Sunday. What happened on a Sunday? He was raised from the dead. So there is, there is no pickle, no problem that I find myself in he's not able to address because he is mighty to save. And we remind ourselves, we cultivate faith in that way. And then um, alongside that, we, we recognize that the, the commitment that we have made, um, Matt and Sarah made commitments today. It wasn't just you that were witnesses to that. The heavens are witness to that. And they kind of tap Matt and Sarah on the shoulder, perhaps periodically say, Matt, Sarah, you remember that? You committed yourself. And it was a, a very public, very cosmic commitment that you were making. Um, and, and they kind of remind us of that. Yeah, it was a commitment that we made. And the vows that we make are, are no light things. And we cultivate faith in that way. That's the first thing. Um, you'll be worried about the time, but don't worry because the next bit is just one verse. But it's important. And uh, verse 13, um, which concludes this. My people, says the Lord, my, keep, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Now, the, the picture um, is, is one that, that we're maybe not that familiar with, but we can kind of get the idea. Um, unlike Scotland, where rain is not a problem, we, we kind of get rain, and watering the land is not a problem. Um, that's why it's, it's a green country. People come from South Africa and they think, wow, the fields are so green. Yeah, because we get a lot of rain. Um, in the, the part of the world, the Middle East, where Jeremiah is speaking, rain is, is a big deal. You are looking for the rain. You are needing the rain. And it doesn't always happen. There are long, long dry spells. And without the rain, you're not able to grow the crops. So you need water. How are you going to do that when it doesn't rain? Well, by and large, you have two options. One is, if, if you happen to be in a place where there are natural springs, that's great. They're there. You've kind of got the resource. That spring is, is just readily available. And if you don't have that, then you have to kind of roll up your sleeves and you have to start digging into the ground without mechanical diggers. This is long before we, you know, JCBs and things like that. Um, you've got to do it yourself, uh, your own sweat uh, to, to dig down through the soil into the rock, hammer away at the rock and create huge big caverns in the rock that will store the water when the rain does come in the hope that you'll have managed to create something big enough to store enough water to be able to irrigate the land and that uh, the water uh, that has been stored there and has remained there for that length of time will not be so stagnant that it is no use to anyone. And in the hope that the rock doesn't kind of leak. That's the kind of picture that's being drawn. And, and the Lord is saying, you know, this is, this is what you've done. The, the choice that all of us have in life is either graft, hard graft, or grace. And the, the graft where you are trying to make sense of life yourself, you are rolling up your sleeves trying to make it happen, make it work, find a meaning, find direction, find purpose, find significance, make a goal of life in your own strength. What he, he is saying in this picture that he uses, you've been digging your own assistance broken systems that don't hold water. He's saying, one, it is hard work, and two, it doesn't work. Um, all your best efforts that leave you exhausted, weary, they actually get you nothing. Is that what you really want, he says? Because that's what you've gone and chosen. 
You've chosen to do it yourself, to figure out, I can, I can do life on my own without reference to the one who gave me that life. And the Lord says that's hard work and it doesn't work. And this picture that is used that is a very graphic telling picture is, is one that just hits home hard. Because the contrast with this graft, hard graft of digging these cisterns in the ground to store somehow the water and finding that actually just leaks out anyway. You get nowhere in life living like that. Contrast to that is grace. And, and we are to celebrate grace. Never to cease delighting in, marveling at, wondering at, and rejoicing in that grace that God extends to us in Jesus, whereby he says, I'll do it all. And, and the picture that he uses is this, that of spring, a spring of living water. That, that's who he is, he says. That's who I am for you, a spring of living water. And, and what happens with a spring? It's freely given. You, you don't have to lift a finger. You don't have to dig in the ground. You don't have to kind of um, do some uh, plumbing in the ground to make somehow water appear. The Lord is, is that fount of water in our lives, freely given. You don't have to do anything. It's, it's a given. And unlike the cisterns, which just store water, usually leaking out the side as well, and by the, uh, the time you need it, it is, it is repulsive to smell. Because all it's done is just stick there in that cistern under the sun for weeks on end, and it's, it's stagnant, um, not, not pleasant at all. So alongside being freely given, it is freshly flowing. Uh, constantly, continually, new, day by day, flowing from the spring. That's who I am, says the Lord. And, and that's the picture that Jesus uses when he comes, uh, when he speaks to this woman in John chapter 4, uh, the woman of Samaria, with all the, the longing in her heart, the, the thirst that there is in her heart and life for life. He says, you're, you're kind of looking in the wrong place. You're trying to dig your own cistern. I'm the one you're after. I'm the one who is that spring of living water. That's when you, when you have me in your life, that's what you have. One who brings refreshment continually, day by day. One who, who irrigates your living in such a manner that your whole life is fruitful. Not through your strength, but through the, the, the living water of his Holy Spirit living in you and through you. Uh, that's who I am. He uses that picture later on in John chapter 7. Same picture again, the spring of living water. The Lord is your life. Um, and, and that's the whole burden of the, the Bible. That's why, we, that's why we delight in Jesus. That's what we discover him to be. He is that spring of living water where, where he is our life. He lives life for us and in us and through us. And, and we simply enjoy his presence. We enjoy his enabling. We enjoy his empowering. And, uh, and that's why we are to celebrate grace and never, ever lose sight of that as we, we go about our day-by-day -day lives, as we continue in our worship of God, we continually remind ourselves it is all of grace. We have been given in the Lord Jesus, we have been given that spring of living water. And daily, constantly, there is that fresh supply of heavenly grace imparting all that we need for the living of our lives. His presence, his enabling, his love, his care, his guidance, his being with us and working through us for his glory. Wonderful. I mean, who in their right mind would not want to enjoy that? And that's what the Lord is saying. You, you've kind of gone way off track here. You have forsaken me, the, uh, the spring of living water, and you've chosen instead to try and, and do it yourself. That's, that's crazy and daft. We're to celebrate grace and marvel at it. Please, God, we shall indeed be enabled, each of us, so to do. Let's join in prayer. Uh, living God, thank you for your word. Thank you that although um, you first spoke that word a long time ago in a very, very different context through a guy called Jeremiah, you can, you can still speak the same word through another guy, Jeremiah, here today. 
And we pray, therefore, please, that by your Holy Spirit, you would take your word and that you would enable us, as we hear that word and heed that word, to learn how to cultivate that faith in our own hearts and lives, to recognize that it's, it's not a magical thing that just, boom, abracadabra happens, but a careful cultivating of it. And that for those who've, who've never made that commitment of their lives to the Lord Jesus, you would prompt them and enable them, even this day, to take that step and be resolved to, to make that commitment of their lives. And that there might be that, that readiness on our part continually to remind ourselves of the enormous privilege and blessing that you impart to us in Christ your Son, that we might delight in you as our glorious God. And simply refuse to countenance any other direction in which our lives are lived and which our lives and energies are invested. And help us to celebrate the wonder of your grace, to delight in that, to revel in that, to rest in that, and daily to be refreshed by that and the knowledge that Jesus, risen, alive, and king, is indeed that spring of living water in our lives. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your son. Use us in his service for his name's sake. Amen. Well, at the uh, end of the service, um, uh, do make sure you chat with Steve at the back. And, and if you would like to think in terms of uh, making that commitment of your life to Christ, come and speak to myself or one of the elders, and uh, we'll gladly uh, just try and take you forward on that basis. But as our closing praise now, we look to the Lord in the words of one of the great Welsh hymns, Guide me, O my great Redeemer. Go then in peace to love and to serve the Lord, and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.